On this Friday night, a major break in the murder of a six separatist leader in D.C. The three alleged hitmen charged and their suspected links to the Indian government. Others may have played a role in this homicide. What's being called India's incompetent campaign against Hardeep Singh Nijjar, a Global News investigation. The threat of foreign interference. The inquiry commissioner's conclusions about meddling in Canada's elections. In it for the long haul. The morale has not uh, dropped. The vow from pro-Palestinian protesters to stand their ground. And the goal to grow women's hockey. And she scores! The game plan to power the PWHL forward. Global National with Farah Nasser. I'm here today to announce that we arrested and charged three individuals for first degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder in relation to Hardeep Nijjar's homicide. A major development tonight in a high profile assassination last summer that took place on Canadian soil. Hardeep Singh Nijjar, a prominent Sikh activist, was gunned down as he was heading home from his local Gurdwara in Surrey, BC. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. We begin with the murder case that's put tremendous pressure on Canada's diplomatic relationship with India. In a highly unusual move last fall, the Prime Minister blamed agents at the Indian state for the murder of a Canadian. And tonight, three men, all Indian nationals, are in custody. We've got this story covered for you from multiple angles tonight. We're going to begin with Jeff Semple, who's in Surrey, B.C. Jeff, what do we know about the links to the Indian government? Well, Farah, Hardeep Nijjar was shot and killed in the parking lot of his Sikh temple here behind me. And sources close to the investigation say they believe India's foreign intelligence agency may have been responsible. It's the news Hardeep Nijjar's friends and family have been waiting a year to hear. So I think there's a, a mixed feeling, one of relief, but also one of concern as to what will Canada do to kind of curb this issue of public safety that we're facing. Nijjar was president of one of Canada's largest Sikh temples with tens of thousands of members. The murder sent shockwaves across this community and triggered an international firestorm. Today I'm rising to inform the House of an extremely serious matter. The Prime Minister accused Indian government agents of Nijjar's murder. But Justin Trudeau provided no details or evidence to support that claim, which India furiously denied. Today, the RCMP backed up that allegation. Thank you all for joining us today. Police arrested three Indian nationals in Edmonton, accused in the murder, and released these photos and videos of their vehicles. Sources say the alleged hitmen entered Canada on student visas, but are actually suspected members of organized crime. And sources believe they may have been acting on orders from India's Foreign Intelligence Agency, which reports directly to India's Prime Minister. There are separate and distinct investigations ongoing into these matters, certainly not limited to the involvement of the people arrested today. And these efforts include investigating connections to the government of India. Under the Modi government, India has just become much more assertive and aggressive. Nijjar was a high-profile member of the international Khalistan movement, campaigning for an independent Sikh state in India's Punjab region. From the Indian government's perspective, they have sort of viewed now what we would call activists as extremists, as threats to their national security. For years, the Indian government had called for Nijjar's arrest, claiming he was the leader of an armed separatist group launching attacks in India, including this one targeting a cinema. But sources say Indian officials provided no credible evidence to support those claims. Sources say the evidence points instead to a covert campaign by Indian officials to silence prominent Sikh separatists abroad. They think they can get away with it uh, simply because history has proven that perpetrators and states are really uh, held accountable for acts of transnational repression. This international law expert points to the United States, where a similar alleged assassination plot against this Sikh activist was thwarted last year. These threats are continuous. India reportedly blamed rogue intelligence officials. And unlike Trudeau, the U.S. downplayed the Indian government's involvement. Considering the growing importance of India and Modi is being received uh, in the West, you know, uh, with open arms and the red carpet is being rolled out. She says Indian officials may have sought to insulate themselves by hiring contract killers, but not without risk. 
They need to reach out to some unsavory characters. And then there's the security of the operation isn't very good because it could already be compromised by Western intelligence or who knows, you can get someone who's indiscreet. But even if the RCMP has evidence of Indian government involvement, its consular officials are protected by diplomatic immunity. The uncomfortable truth is that a foreign diplomat who might have participated in a serious crime cannot be charged, they cannot be detained or arrested. Publicly, the RCMP refused to comment on India's role in Niger's killing, but said Indian officials haven't exactly uh, been I'll, helpful. Well, I'll be frank, I'll correct, ca characterize that uh, collaboration as uh, rather challenging and difficult uh, for the last several years. And representatives from Surrey's Sikh community held a press conference here late today and they called the arrests an important first step but said that they will not rest or feel safe here until those responsible for orchestrating this attack, in their view, representatives of the Indian government are finally brought to justice. Farah? Jeff Semple in Surrey, B.C. Thank you, Jeff. We go next to our Ottawa Bureau Chief, Mercedes Stevenson, on the national security angle here. Mercedes, how significant are the security implications of today's arrests? Well, Farah, they're tremendously significant on a number of levels. First of all, it raises the question of how these individuals had been in Canada. We're hearing for three to five years, potentially, without being detected. Who were they? Why were they connected to the Indian government, as, as is being alleged they may have been? Who recruited them? That's going to be a huge question, because if that person is a diplomat who is working for the Indian government, uh, if they were, in fact, acting on behalf of the Indian government, they could have diplomatic immunity. Beyond that, there's questions about the foreign student program now. If these individuals were able to come in on foreign student visas without being detected, there will be questions about what the security around that program looks like and whether or not it's vetting people carefully enough. And of course, then there's the question of how many other plots there might be against other Canadian citizens and whether the RCMP and CSIS have enough resources to foil those plots. Mercedes, now politically, does this validate what the government's long claimed and how is it going to impact Canada's relationship with India going forward? I think there's more to be seen publicly from the government on exactly what evidence they have. But as you heard from Jeff, our sources are certainly indicating that they believe there may have been a significant link to the Indian government. I expect that you may see some of that caught at trial, but there's also that key point that the RCMP say there are still ongoing police investigations. That means there are other people who they are still looking at, and they may not want to show their hand on that just yet. But the fact that the Indian government was trying to have Mr. Najjar sent back to India for years and then that he became targeted will be significant. The Indian government is not likely to be happy about any of these allegations and they've made it clear before they are willing to make it very difficult for Canadians to get visas to go to India and of course they have significant economic pull. And then there's the geostrategic implications about what it will mean for Canada's role in the Indo-Pacific. Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa. Thank you Mercedes. Now, the RCMP arrest came on the same day Canada's Commission into Foreign Interference released its interim report. India was among the state's commissioner, Marie-José Ong, singled out as having taken part in a range of activities that seek to influence Canadian communities and politicians. Our chief political correspondent, David Aikens, has been looking into the report. David, what did Commissioner Ogg have to say about India? Well, she said there is certainly credible evidence that India is engaging in political interference in Canadian elections, mostly by trying to covertly funnel money towards pro-India candidates. India, for the record, has rejected those allegations. That said, the single biggest threat actor when it comes to our elections is the People's Republic of China. She says, make no mistake, foreign interference did occur in the last two elections, but she finds that it did not undermine the integrity of the electoral system. And she says the Liberals would have won both elections with or without foreign interference. But she is just as clear that foreign interference is causing great harm to Canada's democracy. The acts of interference that occurred, some of these acts have been established while others remain only suspected are a stain on our electoral process. The inquiry was called after Global News and the Globe and Mail first reported on allegations of political interference by state actors from China. 
Ogle suggests ways the government can better deter and counter foreign interference in her second and final report due at the end of the year. Foreign interference is a real occurrence and a serious threat, and one that is probably impossible to completely eradicate. But we must do all that we can to detect, prevent, and counter it. David, this murder in Surrey seems to suggest that foreign interference in Canadian domestic affairs is not just about elections. So can this inquiry address any of that? Not really. Justice Sog has been given a very specific mandate to focus only on the 2019 and 2021 elections. But the murder in Surrey did come up during the inquiry's public hearings, a coalition of, of uh, groups representing sick Canadians. They did have standing in this inquiry. But addressing that broader issue of intimidation by foreign actors, that's really a question for the government. We're going to continue to do everything we can do to dis detect and disrupt this foreign interference. And we're the first government that has put in place a series of measures, including the report uh, of Commissioner uh, Hugg, that, uh, the preliminary report that was released uh, on Friday. And opposition parties are also pushing the government on the same issue. Farah. David Aiken in Ottawa. Thank you, David. There are indications tonight of a possible agreement between Israel and Hamas to de-escalate the crisis in the Middle East. Talks are scheduled this weekend between the two sides in Cairo, Egypt. Still, though, tanks remain parked on the border with Gaza as Israel's invasion of the southern city of Rafah looms. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has vowed total victory in Gaza. But tonight, the indications are that some compromises may be in the works. The Associated Press is reporting a potential phased de-escalation. The first phase would have female civilian hostages be freed in exchange for Palestinian prisoners in Israel. And if that happens, then six weeks after, all remaining hostages would be released in exchange for more prisoners. And then the third phase would see the return of the remains of the deceased hostages. Student protests expand ahead. The campus demonstrations that are growing across Canadian universities. Protests against the conflict in Gaza are spreading across Canadian university campuses. Demonstrators at the University of Toronto were told to leave by 10 p.m. last night. But the school says they won't be removed as long as the protests remain peaceful. And at McGill University in Montreal, protests have stretched into a seventh day. Students have vowed to stay until their demands are met. Nithu Garcha reports on the protests as universities grapple with what to do about them. On the second day of the pro-Palestinian encampment at the University of Toronto, the peaceful demonstration appears to have expanded with protesters expressing their commitment for the long term. Despite the administration's initial request for them to leave, protesters were allowed to stay overnight provided their activities remained peaceful. I think the university is wisely chosen not to use police force. Uh, to try to disperse this encampment. Concerns have been raised by Jewish student groups over rising tensions on campus. This is a safe uh, place for Jewish uh, students, faculty and staff. In order for Israelis and Palestinians to have a future together, we need more students like this who are willing to challenge restrictions placed on Palestinian freedom. At McGill University, pressure is ramping up for officials to take action after two opposing demonstrations clashed on the campus Thursday. A lot of people still have this commitment and we, uh, we, we don't, the, the morale has not uh, dropped. With calls from Jewish groups for universities to enforce existing policies against harassment and intimidation, the encampment demanding McGill divest from companies with Israeli ties is in its seventh day. Those funds are directly leading to bombing campaigns, to militarization, to blocking aid, block, um, aid deliveries. So they're participating actively and materially in the war and in the genocide. At the University of British Columbia, a growing encampment is in its fifth day, also calling for divestment and for the university to join a global academic boycott of Israeli universities. Students plan to continue their demonstration until those demands are met. Nitu Garcha, Global News, Vancouver.
the prelude to an assassination. Coming up, what's being called India's coercive campaign against Hardeep Singh Nidjar, a global news investigation. Returning now to our top story in the arrest of three Indian nationals in connection to the killing of BC Sikh leader Hardeep Singh Nidjar. Jeff Semple joins us again from Surrey, BC. Jeff, you, along with the Global News investigative team, have been looking into the lead up to Niger's murder last June. What have you learned? Well, Farah, our investigation has found that Niger's murder was the culmination of a years-long campaign by the Indian government that our sources have described as both coercive and incompetent. Five years before Hardeep Nijjar was murdered, sources say Indian officials sent an urgent message to the RCMP, claiming India was about to be attacked by a terrorist bomb plot. To stop it, the RCMP needed to arrest Nijjar immediately. So the RCMP took the BC Sikh leader into custody. But sources say it quickly became apparent India had no credible evidence against him. So the Mounties released Nijjar. But India didn't stop there. India is emboldened. They are becoming a regional powerhouse and they want to be taken more serious. For almost a decade, Indian officials filed extradition requests and Interpol notices demanding Nijjar's arrest, claiming he was the mastermind behind an armed Sikh separatist group planning attacks on India. In 2015, India claimed this video was evidence of Nijjar organizing a weapons training camp in B.C. Sources say the RCMP investigated, but found no evidence to support the claim from India's intelligence agency. I would say they're not known as a very good intelligence agency. There's certain countries that Canada knows you have to take their information with a grain of salt. And some of their evidence was also allegedly obtained through torture. This permanent resident of Canada and friend of Nijjar's returned to India for his wedding in 2016. He says he was arrested, tortured, and later released. But his lawyer says India is not allowing him to return to Canada. There's a lot of torture. There's a lot of confessions that are solicited under torture. And um, India presents these dossiers and expects everyone to act upon them. Canada's Sikh community is the largest outside of India. And the Indian government has long alleged that Canada is a hotbed of militant Khalistan separatists, pointing to public campaigning for an independent Sikh state in India, and blaming Canada for attacks such as the Air India bombing 40 years ago that killed 329 people, mostly Canadians. There's a grain of truth in this. If you look back at the Air India, the bombing, Canadian security clearly dropped the ball there. It was a massive intelligence failure. The only difference is the threat environment has changed and you don't have Sikh extremism. Experts say the Sikh separatist threat in India today is almost non-existent, but the fight against the Khalistan movement abroad plays well politically at home. These assassinations have really burnished Modi's credentials as someone that's gonna protect India, and it burnished Modi's image of himself as India's strong man. The Indian government has fiercely denied playing any role in Niger's murder, and India, meanwhile, is in the midst of an election, with Prime Minister Modi widely expected to win a consecutive third term. Farah? Jeff Semple in Surrey, B.C. Thanks, Jeff. Scoring goals next. The Canadian women buying in and giving back for the love of the game. The pursuit for the Professional Women's Hockey League's ultimate prize, the Walter Cup, is heating up. Three teams are chasing the final two playoff positions this weekend. But throughout the entire inaugural season, two Canadian players have gone above and beyond to help grow the game. As Mike Durley explains, Renata Fast and Emily Clark are building the fan base of the future. In close now, Fast shoots, she scores! For years, Renata Fast wondered what could be for her hockey career. There was U.S. college hockey, the Olympics, and not much in between. So the only thing I really aspired to do was to play on that national team. Wade Keller wanted to call and Clark scores! Emily Clark could roof a puck like a few others. Top shelf beauty! Yet she knew skill could only take her so far. Yeah, growing up you want to be the first girl in the NHL and then at some point whether you realize it or not, that dream just kind of fades and it's not a reality, so you, you don't really even think about it because it wasn't a dream that you could have. Well now, as the inaugural PWHL season comes to an end, 
they can see the dream clearly. Nothing has come easy for the women of the PWHL. From lead conception to first puck drop, it was only six months. So they didn't have time to come up with team names or anything beyond basic jerseys. But sometimes challenges create opportunities. And now the league can evolve with input from its fervent fan base. Players like Fast and Clark are doing their part by hosting families they've met through various charities and hockey leagues at each game. As Olympians, they know their role models to young boys and girls, but now, with a league of their own, they've become ambassadors to the sport. I'm so excited to watch it grow. Grow indeed. Fast also works in development with the Burlington Girls Hockey Club, which is thriving in part because of the PWHL. When you see some of the footage and, and, and stuff coming out of the PWHL games, it's flooded with Barracuda's jerseys, Oakville Hornets jerseys. Like you see them, you, they just stick out because you see them there. Um, so it means it's drawing the attention of a lot of a lot of these girls. A lot of girls with big dreams and no more limits. Mike Trollet, Global News Toronto. And that's Global National for this Friday night. I'm Farah Nasser. Tonight's Your Canada is downtown Calgary, and we love seeing Your Canada. So please keep emailing us your photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Until tomorrow, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Good night.